Good morning. I'm Lendl Gentry, formerly from the University of Wisconsin, uh, now retired. My co-moderator for this session will be Hilda Stambuck from Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. This next uh, session, number 14, is a SAM session for number four. This will be a Temporal Bone 3.0. The first speaker will be Joel Swartz, president of Germantown Imaging Associates, Gladwine, Pennsylvania. He will be giving the Valvasori Lecture on Advances in Temporal Bone Imaging, Past to Present. I am pleased and proud to have the opportunity to present the 2020 Valvasori Lecture this year entitled Advances in Temporal Bone Imaging, Past to Present. I have chosen to follow the development of the imaging approach to the temporal bone through the years with special focus on specific advancements and course-altering publications. The lecture is divided into four parts. A good starting point is the December 1974 issue of the Radiologic Clinics of North America, Radiology of the Ear, edited by Dr. Guy Potter, who is one of the founding members of our society. This is an excellent collection of pre-CT knowledge. In the 60s and 70s, the first line examination of patients requiring temporal bone imaging was plain film examination. The PA view was uh, performed with the uh, temporal bone projected with, uh, through the orbits zero degrees to the orbitomiatal line. The Caldwell view projected the temporal bone below the orbits 20 degrees off the orbitomiatal line. And the town view was an AP view 37 degrees off the uh, orbitomiatal line at the level of the frame and magnum. Next line examination was con multi-directional polytomography. Uh, coronal images here are at the level of the cochlea and the vestibule, and lateral images are at the level of the molar tooth, the malleus and the incus, the round window and the vestibule, and more medially at the level of the internal auditory canal. In the early 80s, high-resolution CT became available, and axial images were the most easily accessible plane, which required us to learn our anatomy uh, in a completely different projection. Uh, coronal images were done directly, often with the patient's prone and neck extended, and the quality depended on the patient's ability to hold still and keep their neck extended. Our General Electric 8800 provided 15 degrees of addi additional gantry angulation, and our General Electric 9800 provided 20 degrees of it additional gantry angulation. These sections, CT sections back then, were performed one slice at a time, and the reconstruction with the bony algorithm was performed later. Arguably, the most fascinating evolution of any branch of temporal bone imaging is congenital developmental disorders. Only a handful of events shaped the evolution of our pre-CT knowledge. The resolution of multidirectional polytomography was limited, so our knowledge, our knowledge was advancing slowly. Radiologists were well aware from basic embryology that the development of the middle and external ear and the inner ear were for the most part mutually exclusive with the inner ear developing earlier from neuroectoderm and the external and middle ear developing subsequently from mesoderm. Early imaging was perhaps most helpful for individuals with a dysplastic oracle and presumed external auditory canal atresia. With the advent of CT, we could more easily evaluate atresia plate thickness as well as the typical fusion deformity of the proximal acicular chain. And atresia could be diagnosed as membranous or bony. And the classic anterior positioning of the mastoid segment of the facial nerve canal could be appreciated. In 1987, this article appeared in Laryngoscope, authored by Dr. Jackler and Associates. Jackler pointed out that a large number of dissimilar entities were being lumped under the inaccurate term Mundini dysplasia, and so the authors uh, formatted 
their classification based upon the week during embryogenesis that the arrested development occurred. In 2002, this article appeared in Laryngoscope, authored by Dr. Levent Sanaraglu from Ankara, Turkey. This was a new classification for cochleovestibular malformations, which continues to evolve to this day. Dr. Sanaraglu and others have emphasized the importance of the interscalar septum, which is a thin bony plate radiating from the modiolus, separating each turn of the cochlea. The incomplete partition describes defects in the modiolus and interscalar septum. Those with an absent modiolus, an absent interscalar septum, are referred to as incomplete partition type 1, which is associated with a cystic cochlea. Incomplete partition type 2 is associated with a normal basilar turn. There is a deficient interscalar septum between the apical and middle turns, and this deformity is consistently associated with a large vestibular aqueduct. A syndrome of X-linked mixed deafness with congenital fixation of the stapes foot footplate and perilymphatic gusher was described by Nance in 1971 and further elucidated by Phelps in 1991 utilizing CT scanning. These patients have a bulbous internal auditory canal. The uh, interscalar septum is present, however, the modiolus and lamina cribrosa are absent, which dramatically increases intralabyrinthine pressure so that any manipulation of the stapes could conceivably right result in the dangerous perilymphatic gusher. Sonaraglu described the findings in further detail in this article in 2006 and reclassified this deformity as incomplete partition type 3. A genetic locus was subsequently uh, defined, and this was recently further studied by Hong from Sh uh, Shanghai, China, who identified a cystic vestibule in 90% of cases. Uh, Dr. Uh, Valvasori described 50 patients with a large vestibular aqueduct, many of whom had fluctuating sensory neural hearing loss, worsened by a mild traumatic event. He coined the term the large vestibular aqueduct syndrome. Approximately 20 years later, a group from Gainesville examined, a, examined similar patients and found that each and every patient had an abnormal modiolus and further concluded that a large vestibular aqueduct may only occasionally, if ever, be an isolated developmental anomaly. Studies from the University of Utah in the late 90s emphasized the value of MRI for the identification of the associated large endolymphatic duct and sac uh, this patient also has a modular deficiency. This is an axial CT of the right ear demonstrating a normal oval window. Uh, in the early 80s, we uh, were of, able to develop a method for diagnosis of fenestral otosclerosis utilizing axial images. This is a small anterior plaque. Uh, in the anterior oval window, displacing the stapes, stapes superstructure. And this is a much larger plaque, which is associated with some cochlear uh, disease. We showed this to our uh, surgeons who were largely underwhelmed because conductive hearing loss manifest audiometrically by the air bone gap was already a reason for surgical intervention. However, they were much more interested in our ability to diagnose the dehiscent protruding tympanic segment of the facial nerve, which would extend down into the oval window niche and was clearly a surgical obstacle. Furthermore, this loop of nerve may actually cause conductive hearing loss due to stapes impingement.
Later in the 80s, we learned to diagnose uh, cochlear otospongiotic changes as well as its mimics, such as osteogenesis imperfecta, and in this case, invasive cholesteatoma. The aberrant internal carotid artery was unfortunately often diagnosed via surgical misadventure in individuals with a reddish mass behind an intact tympanic membrane. Uh, in fortunate patients, a preoperative angiogram might be recommended. This exam depicts the vestibular line of lapiocre labio defined as a perpendicular line drawn tangential to the lateral wall of the vestibule. Here, the internal carotid artery is uh, clearly lateral to this line and therefore located within the middle ear. Arguably, this is the important, most important diagnosis to make and not miss in all of temporal bone imaging. An article in Radiographics by Dr. Lowe in 1985 sub substantially advanced our understanding of this rare anomaly. This is a coronal CT of the right ear demonstrating the normal vertical portion of the carotid canal. In aberrant internal carotid artery, the vertical portion of the carotid canal is absent and there is often subtle erosion of the otocapsule due to pulsations. This is a normal axial CT of the right ear demonstrating the normal horizontal portion of the carotid canal. The aberrant artery is contiguous with the horizontal portion of the canal, as we see on this image. Dr. Lowe also described in detail the anatomy of the normal inferior tympanic canaliculus, which contains the inferior tympanic nerve and the inferior tympanic artery. In aberrant internal carotid artery, the territory of the internal carotid artery is assumed by the inferior tympanic artery and therefore enters the skull via an enlarged inferior tympanic canaliculus. This can also be seen on axial images, and 30% of these patients have a persistent stapedial artery. Imaging findings in cochlear nerve deficiency was described in this article from Utah in 2002. This patient has a thick bony web occluding the cochlear nerve or foramen, and the cochlear nerve is absent, manifest by uh, a vacant antero-inferior quadrant of the internal auditory canal. In this normal case, we can see the uh, normal cochlear nerve populating the antero-inferior quadrant of the canal. Sound-induced vertigo, teleos phenomenon, and pressure-induced vertigo due to bone dehiscence of the superior semicircular canal was described in 1998 by a group from Johns Hopkins. This is a normal coronal CT and a normal partial projection, which is perpendicular to the long axis of the temporal bone. And each of these images demonstrating the normal cortex over the superior semicircular canal. In this patient with Tullio phenomenon, we can see a defect on the, in the superior semicircular canal in the coronal plane as well as in the partial plane. Uh, this entity was studied further in 2016, and a, uh, a spectrum of third mobile window abnormalities was described, which would cause identical symptomatology, including posterior semicircular canal dehiscence, perilymphatic fistula, and enlarged vestibular aqueduct, as well as otospongiosis. The most common neoplasm of the temporal bone is schwannoma of the eighth cranial nerve, the acoustic neuroma. In the 60s and 70s, two major pieces of technology were needed. First, multidirectional tomography, and second, a ruler, because internal auditory canals were symmetric, and when these were measured, it was found that less than one millimeter difference was insignificant, one to two millimeter uh, difference was questionable, and greater than two millimeter difference in the size of the internal auditory canal, as we see here, is indicative of tumor in 95% of cases. In difficult cases, uh, panic pake could be instilled via lumbar puncture and manipulated into the uh, cerebellopontine angle. In normal cases, filling the internal auditory canal, and in abnormal cases, demonstrating a filling defect. 
Uh, diagnostic angiography was used in patients with unilateral sensory neural hearing loss and uh, tried to ev evaluate the anterior inferior cerebellar artery and superior cerebellar artery in the arterial phase and the vein of the lateral recess of the fourth ventricle as well as the petrosal vein in the venous phase. Tum tumor circulation and capsular staining were highly variable, and a significant emphasis was placed on identifying the internal auditory branch of the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, but the location and source of the vessel proved too inconsistent. Early CT images were, of course, able to identify larger lesions. There were significant volume averaging, issues for smaller lesions, however, and several early observers were fooled by the normal flocculus, which may enhance somewhat. This article appeared in AJNR. It was actually the very first issue, January, February 1980. Uh, this seems barbaric now, but at the time it was extraordinarily helpful, largely because of the volume averaging issues with CT that I just described, and this procedure worked very well. I was uncomfortable doing a lumbar puncture in the CT suite, so I performed the lumbar puncture and injected three C's of room air under fluoroscopy and transported the patient to the uh, CT, CT suite thusly. Um, this delineated the tumor in an excellent fashion, and furthermore, the study was consistently diagnostic even if, if the patient would cough or turn their head, or even if the gantry collapsed, the study always seemed to work. Furthermore, this examination provided detailed uh, anatomy of the nerves within the canal and ena enabled the diagnosis of vascular loops. In this article from Utah in 1998, the normal and diseased acoustic pathway was described. For me, the most important uh, takeaway of this, uh, of this article was the recognition that lesions of the cochlear nuclei located within the posterolateral aspect of the upper medulla may cause unilateral retrocochlear loss clinically indistinguishable from that caused by intracanalicular acoustic tumors. This MS this is an MS plaque, but any causative process so fortuitously located could cause identical unilateral retrocochlear symptomatology. The second most common tumor of the temporal bone is the glomus jugulari tumor. With conventional multidirectional tomography in the 60s and 70s, we're able to identify the normally corticated jugular foramen, and we recognize the jugular foramina were quite commonly asymmetric, often markedly so. If a patient was diagnosed with a destructive lesion, they may go straight to angiography because these lesions uh, blushed consistently and intensely uh, with contrast, and we knew that the supply to this uh, lesion was usually from the ascending pharyngeal artery. Uh, as CT, CT scanning became more evolved, we were able to easily recognize the normal jugular foramen uh, with the excellent uh, cortication of the uh, margins. If a destructive lesion was demonstrated, patient may go to MRI, in which case we were able to diagnose the vascular channels within the lesion, so typical of this lesion. In some institutions, the rare endolymphatic sac tumor was confused with paraganglioma, prompting uh, this case report in 1993 in AJNR, and, uh, in, uh, and as well as this commentary by uh, Dr. Lowe. This is normal axial CT of the posterior petrous surface with the normal vestibular aqueduct. This uh, uh, drawing demonstrates the normal endolymphatic duct and sac. The endolymphatic sac tumor has epicenter along the posterior petrous pyramid in the region of the vestibular aqueduct and results in bone destruction in this location. Angiographically, these lesions are also associated with an intense blush, and there is a strong association with von Hippel-Lindau disease. CT became widely available in the late 70s, but early resolution ME scanners were not particularly helpful for inflammatory disease, and this article appeared in AJR in 1979, demonstrating how plain film and polytomography uh, could be utilized to evaluate patients with erosive otitis media.
Polydirectional tomograms were of significant use in evaluation of uh, bony changes uh, in this disorder. But our CT8800 unit in the early 80s really turned on the lights. In 1985 and 86, these two articles appeared in Radiology, authored by Dr. Mahmoud Mafi. He uh, discussed in detail acute otomastoiditis and chronic otomastoiditis and described them as two different diseases. Acute otitis media, the result from resulting from bacterial infection and chronic otitis media from chronic eustachian tube dysfunction. Since they're two completely different diseases, they also have two completely different sets of complications. If a patient with acute otomastoiditis is uh, evaluated early in the course with CT, it may demonstrate diffuse debris in the peripheral mastoid. However, mastoid septations are intact. If antibiotic therapy is insufficient, a patient can develop a dangerous coalescent uh, mastoiditis manifest by diffuse bony destruction in this region, in my view. Petrus apocytis is a coalescent mastoiditis occurring in a patient with a uh, pneumatized uh, petrus apex. This uh, is associated on MRI with irregular uh, regional uh, contrast enhancement and often by leptomeningeal disease manifest in this case by enhancement of the seventh and eighth cranial nerves. Very few patients actually have the classic great inigo triad. The group from Utah described leave me alone lesions of the Petrus apex in 1997, most notably asymmetric fatty marrow and trapped fluid, so-called Petrus apex effusion. This is a normal coronal CT of the right ear demonstrating the sputum. This is a normal axial CT of the right ear demonstrating the normal facial recess. Uh, cholesteatoma arising from the pars flaccida of the tympanic membrane began in, began in Prusak space and erode the sputum, most easily seen on coronal images, and cholesteatomas arising from the posterior superior pars tensa of the tympanic membrane have epicenter in the facial recess and are best seen on axial images. We learned to diagnose complications of cholesteatoma, such as lateral semicircular canal fistula and ossicular erosion. In the early 90s, we learned that uh, granulation tissue within the middle ear enhanced intensely with contrast. However, cholesteatoma did not enhance in this uh, case report in 2001 from that school up north, they identified restricted diffusion within a cholesteatoma, which was subsequently further studied and found to be a quite consistent finding and diffusion weighted imaging is an important part of cholesteatoma imaging to this day. Chronic labyrinthitis often results in ossification of the perilymphatic and endolymphatic spaces, referred to as labyrinthitis ossificans. This was seen with conventional multidirectional tomography, but is much more easily seen with CT scanning. And there are implications for cochlear implantation due to limitation of cochlear patency. In acute and subacute labyrinthitis, the CT scan is normal. In this article from the Washington Hospital Center in 1993 by Dr. Mark and Fitzgerald, uh, they demonstrated that the sole imaging finding in these patients is enhancement of the normally non-enhancing fluid-filled spaces of the labyrinth. But they were quick to note that the majority of patients with acute and subacute labyrinthitis will not have labyrinthine enhancement or any other imaging finding. In 1990, this article was published from University of California in San Francisco. Uh, they demonstrated the consistent enhancement that we see in individuals with Bell's palsy. And it was noted that the most common uh, place to visualize such enhancement was the anterosuperior quadrant of the internal auditory canal. Uh, 
conventional multi directional tomography of course had some value for trauma uh, fractures were difficult to identify but uh, certainly such an evaluation was worthwhile in 1977 this article appeared in AJR um, uh, before the advent of CT and described in detail the anatomy and pathology of the ankylostapedial articulation, but it wasn't until CT was available that we, we could clearly uh, see this articulation and diagnose uh, ankylostapedial joint subluxation like we have here. Uh, similarly, uh, traumatic dislocation of the stapes uh, could be diagnosed. Here we have a normal stapes, and here we have a traumatically disrupted stapes that is, has uh, prolapsed into the vestibule. Intralabyrinth intralabyrinthine intralabyrin hemorrhage was uh, diagnosed uh, anecdotally in uh, uh, several uh, patients. Uh, this can be due to anticoagulant therapy or due to trauma. I found this article in uh, a review article from France to be quite valuable because it subcategorized transverse fractures into a medial subtype which traverses the fundus of the internal auditory canal and results in hearing loss secondary to cochlear nerve transection and differentiated this from a lateral subtype with which traverses the bony labyrinth and results in sensory neural hearing loss often with perilymphatic fistula we can see the uh, pneumo labyrinth here uh, within the vestibule finally this article appeared just this year in 2020 which is a detailed analysis of findings on mri and ct in patients with temporal bone trauma I thank you very much for this opportunity to present to you today. The next speaker is Hugh Curtin, Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. He's a professor of radiology at Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. He will be speaking on temporal bone anatomy and embryology. Hello, everybody. My name is Hugh Curtin, and uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about temporal bone anatomy and embryology, mostly about the anatomy, but we'll put in a little bit of embryology uh, that sort of applies to some of the things that, we'll, that we see uh, when we're looking at various pathologies of the temporal bone. So the temporal bone is really a pretty complex structure. Uh, there are nooks and crannies, things going this way and that. It really is not organized for us to understand it very well, uh, but we're going to try to simplify it so that we can uh, know the anatomy, particularly for sectional imaging. Now here you've got the lateral canal, the cochlea. Everything seems to be just sort of put in at random. But if we have an approach, uh, we should be able to work some of this through. And this is how I learned the temporal bone. Jacqueline Vigneault, Professor Vigneault from uh, Paris, uh, would have us draw this diagram. A lot of us spent some time with her learning about temporal bone imaging. And so she would have us learn uh, to draw this diagram. Now, why would she do that? She wanted us to know the basic relationships of the things that are important at imaging, the stuff that we're going to be seeing every day. So, here is the cochlea, the vestibule, semicircular canals, petrous apex, external canal, internal canal, malleus, incus, middle ear, eustachian tube. So all of the basic things are there. If you add the facial nerve and the foot plate of the stapes, know about where they are, what their relationships are. You really can go through uh, the anatomy and you can go through the imaging and not get too confused, hopefully. So... We're going to come back to this over and over again. We're going to start out by doing axial imaging, and that's what we're going to spend the most time on. We'll spend a little bit of uh, on CT and a little bit of histology. Then we're going to go to the embryology, because once you know some of the key anatomic points in the axial plane, uh, it makes it easier to describe what we're going to about the embryology. If we have time, we'll get back to some of the other obliquities as well. But this is really basically what you want to know, and we're going to show you how to apply that. First of all, we do our imaging, so it's not really the plane that we're going to look at, but it is a plane that will give us a 3D data set uh, 
uh, so that you, when you acquire them, you're going to miss the eyes and the teeth. No artifacts and the lens of the eye is not affected. But our technologists will then use a sagittal image to find the lateral semicircular canal. Here's the facial nerve, Tegman, TMJ, Malleus Incus. So here, it's very easy to find these two holes, which are the lateral canal. They connect the dots. We have a standardized plane. Now, why do we do that? Well, the standardized plane allows us to learn the anatomy without having to make constant mental adjustments. If you change the angle, even 10, 15 degrees, maybe three degrees even, it's gonna look different. So it's hard enough to learn the temporal bone anatomy uh, in one plane, much less many. Uh, so we're gonna use a standardized plane. And then the coronal is just perpendicular to that. Well, we're gonna start with the axial imaging. So the axial imaging, even if we use the right plane, Still, there's a lot of anatomy. By the way, this is the uh, website where you can find all of this material, and hopefully uh, it can be of uh, help to you. Key thing, Autopathology Laboratory. If you get lost, just search for that. Look for educational resources. It'll take you right to it. Otherwise, I know it's a long uh, name. But all right, so... We're going to take maybe the 25, 30 images that would be a temporal bone scan and distill it down. You really only have to know the anatomy on these five images. Now, these are so typical that we actually have given them names. The lateral canal is a ring. That's how we know it's in the standard plane. IAC, facial nerve. And then here, the next one is the level of the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. And here you can see it right through here, tympanic segment of the facial nerve, the genu, first branch for first segment, labyrinthine segment, then genu. And so now we have the tympanic segment. So lateral canal, tympanic facial, oval window. That's where we see a lot of anatomy of the cochlea as well. This one's probably the key image. So we're going to go through it, spend a little more time on it. Then you drop down from oval to round window, see the rest of the cochlea. But we've really taken those four images right through here. So we're not, we haven't really uh, incorporated a whole lot of anatomy, have we? But you can, once you know this, you can find your way up and down and name all the structures that come into view. Then we drop down so you get to the point where you can see the carotid canal, jugular uh, foramen, so jugular plate, carotid plate, the facial nerve is now in cross-section. Just to re-emphasize, if we start up at the level of the lateral canal, you can use this diagram to tell what you've got. Well, there is the labyrinthine segment, then the genu, see a little bit of the malleus nacus, but the lateral canal looks like the ring. Here, you have the tympanic segment dropping back through here. And it's going right through the middle ear. Here's the ice cream cone with the malleus and the ancus, short process, lateral wall of the attic, tegmans up here, a little bit of the cochlea, vestibule, internal auditory canal is just right up here at this level. This one is the real workhorse of the axial imaging. We use this when we're looking for congenital anomalies of the cochlea. We use it when we're looking for otosclerosis. So knowing the anatomy on this is really pretty key. All these little nooks and crannies, you saw them on the uh, gross uh, section. Well, here it's going to be important that you can see these, but if you just look on this one level, you'll see almost all of them, and you'll be able to get oriented. But here, modialis, interscalar septum, foot plate of the stapes, and that's where otosclerosis begins right up at the anterior edge. Here you've got the pyramidal process and the facial nerve. Here you've got the sinus tympani, the nooks and crannies. Sinus tympani is between the back of the oval window and the pyramidal process. Goes up and down a little bit. Here, the anterior epitympanic recess. This is the cog at one side, cochleariform process at the other. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we go. Here's the lateral wall of the attic. So it's just above, really close to what's called Prusak space and then the facial recess. So again, if you know this anatomy, uh, you're really in pretty good shape. Should know the other four images as well. 
drop down. Here's the external canal. Now you see all the turns of the cochlea and the round window membrane. You see part of the malleus. Here's incus. You're right up close to the stapedius. And here, or sorry, the stapes. There's the stapedius muscle and the facial nerve again cut in cross section. Drop down, carotid plate, jugular plate, and so on. So that anatomy is really the basics. So if you're just starting out, learn that. Spend your time on that along with the diagram and you'll be in pretty good shape. All right, now let's go through some of the histology, just a little bit of the histology. to will emphasize the point that even if you're not exactly on, you're gonna be able to figure out where you are as long as you're very familiar with these five index images. Here you've got the facial nerve to the genu. Go down a little bit. By the way, this is the utricle. Uh, here is the utricle lateral canal. Uh, people are starting to look for this on MRI, so maybe we'll be including more of this at the next one. But here, the next uh, head and neck meeting. But here you have the lateral canal. Drop down. Now you have the saccule, the utricle. Here's the facial nerve headed into the middle ear. And there you can see it going through the middle ear, malleus, incus. Here you're starting to see the segmentation of the cochlea, but now the facial nerve, there you see the oval window. We just left the lateral canal. So that's all packed up into one little section. Drop down and now we really get into some of the very interesting anatomy. And we'll talk about this when we talk about the embryology. Here's the medialis. Here is the interscalar septum. More about that later, but that is really the key, we feel. It's the key to an analyzing uh, an anomaly of the cochlea. If that's present, you're probably not going to see much else. So medialis, interscalar septum, and the anchor point laterally. And we'll talk about where that forms embryologically in just a few minutes. Then you have the stapes. Facial nerve is starting its curve, so it eventually will be cut in cross-section, and it'll start to look like a ring. Here, you've got the medialis and the interscalar septum. Again, get very used to that. Here's where otosclerosis forms, right at, find the anterior uh, wall of the vestibule, and then the little bit between the cochleariform process and the anterior oval window. These should be pretty symmetric. Here, you can see it a little bit better. There's the cochleariform process, a little thing that they use surgically as a landmark, uh, but we can use it as well to some extent. The tensor tympani is going to come up and then go over to the malleus. Here's the foot plate. Drop down again, and now you see all of the turns of the cochlea, one, two, three. And we're also getting very close to, and now we see the round window membrane just through in here. Again, sinus tympani, pyramidal process with the stapedius. There's the tendon, facial nerve, etc. So again, the anatomy will extend up and down just a little bit from the uh, different structures uh, that we're dealing with that we've already pointed out. But those five images, if you know them, you know the anatomy. Here, the round window membrane again. All right, so these are the five images that you need to know. Lateral canal, facial nerve, foot plate of the stapes, or oval window, round window, and then the vessels down below. But we'll get back to that. We're just going to show you one coronal, but again, there are five index images for that too. Here you have the facial nerve sitting on top of the cochlea. So we're drawing our line right across here. You see the facial nerve at two different points. One, two. Then you go down to here. This is the key landmark. Here is the lateral canal, facial nerve, and foot plate of the stapes, incus and stapes. In through there, promontory, IAC, EAC, scutum, Prusak space is hiding right in here, lateral wall, the attic integument. We're not going to spend too much time on this, but this is a key image because this is a key relationship. You have the uh, a lateral canal, the facial nerve, and the foot plate of the stapes. You have to guarantee or show them that that's in the right place. And why do you have to do that? Well, it's very important because a lot of surgery is done here. And so you want to make sure they don't injure the facial nerve.
All right, so now we're going to spread out just a little bit and talk about the embryology. Now, why do we choose to talk about it here? We've got enough of the normal anatomy, particularly in the axial plane, so that you're going to understand at least this first part about what we're going to, we're going to cover. But here is the anatomy of a four-week embryo. You have a lens placode. Here you've got the uh, primitive oral cavity, maxillary process. And here you've got the first and second branchial arch with the cleft. Now, a lot of things are going to develop from here. We're used to looking and thinking about those, uh, but uh, we're going to de uh, delve a little bit more deeply into some of the things that come from the mesoderm. We talk about the ectoderm, the endoderm. Well, the mesoderm has a lot to do with what we're seeing, so we're going to emphasize that. This is the epibranchial placode, and this is the otic placode. This forms the membranous labyrinth. We're going to uh, refer to it as the otic epithelium. The epibranchial placode, not as important, but you should probably know about it, because this is, this will form part of the nerves, part of the neural elements, and so uh, it is important to know it's there. But we're going to be talking almost exclusively about the otic placode and then some of the things that are going to form the middle ear. So two big things, otic placode will form the membranous labyrinth, and then we'll show you the middle ear, uh, an external canal forming from the first branchial cleft, but then we're going to emphasize mesodermal change that is going to figure into what we're look for, looking for for congenital anomalies, particularly the Mondini. So let's show you how that works. Well, first of all, what is the otic epithelium? That's out here. It's not neural crest. It's not part of the neural tube. Otic epithelium is by itself out on the side of the embryo. It just thickens up a little bit, and then it invaginates to form the otic, otic pit. You have neural crest cells, some delaminating cells. Those are going to figure into forming the nerves, but we're not going to emphasize that so much. It'll take a longer talk. But first, you get the otic pit, and then it turns in to the otocyst, and eventually separates from the ectoderm, if you will, out here. So this is how, and then the entire endolymphatic system, the membranous labyrinth will come from this. You have some neural tissue here from the neural crest, delaminated cells, a little bit from the epibranchial placode maybe. I don't think they got quite this far, but this is important. This is the otic otocyst. This is the otic epithelium, but the mesoderm is going to have to react to it so that we get what we see at the image, on the image, on the CT. So let's go from there. But first, before we do that, let's form the middle ear and mastoid. Also notice the mesoderm in between these, the first and second branchial arches. Uh, here is the cleft, but the ossicles are going to form from the mesoderm of the first and second branchial arches. So but this is how we get the cavities. It invaginates up from the endoderm, from the pharynx. The uh, ectoderm gives us the external auditory canal. These ossicles, meantime, are forming from the all-important mesoderm. Here's the facial nerve as well. Eventually, it comes up so you have the middle ear lined by the endoderm. Here's the mastoid. Here, the tympanic membrane is in between the invaginating uh, first branchial cleft, and here's the first branchial pouch. All right, so now we have formed the otocyst, where you can see it's beginning to curl. We formed the middle ear and the mastoid. Now we're going to come back and talk about a congenital anomaly of the inner ear and what we're actually seeing. So now we're going to talk about a Mondini. Now this is a typical Mondini or IP2 uh, under segmentation, the ENT, the otologist may refer to it as a scala communis. But what are we actually seeing? Well, remember, this was the otocyst. What does that form? It forms these little nooks and crannies. Now, it's easier to navigate if we go to the spiral ligament, which is on the outside. This is normal. Here's the basal or membrane. Reisner's membrane, organ of Cordy, but look for the spiral ligament because then you can count the turns. This is normal, and this is the Mondini, but we've actually got all of the turns, basilar turn, second turn, apical turn. So it's not really an arrest in the curve and the formation 
of the uh, otic epithelium, the abnormality really relates to the mesoderm. So here is the typical CT of a Mondini, and here's the MR. There is some segmentation that you can see because MR can pick up the soft tissues, so it would be able to see. See, these are neural elements going through. Those you'd be able to see, but if it doesn't have a bony element, you wouldn't see it. So this is the typical approach. This is the way we, here we've got uh, the otic epithelium. Here we have the ossicles. But what you're noticing, there are no cavities. This is the endolymphatic space. We don't have any perilymphatic space. Where does that come from? That specialized changes in the mesoderm. It may be incited by the uh, otic epithelium, but it's going to be a change we're going to see in the mesoderm right next to it. Now, this is the way this, once you start out with a little tiny otocyst, it's then going to curl off to find the cochlear duct, semicircular canals, etc. But the perilymphatic spaces form differently, and they start about somewhere in here. So you have some production already, but no spaces around. So all you would see is the epithelium uh, at this level. And this is what happens. You have the otic vesicle, and this is early on, so you have the otic vesicle, and then you have condensation of the otic capsule a little bit around it. Okay, no perilymphatic spaces. That would be about like this. A little later on, it actually starts to begin at 25 millimeters, uh, but we're picking out a certain section. This is the otic epithelium, and here it is. Now this is expanded, but this is just a little line right around it. Well, the precartilage, which is denser mesenchyme, actually is going to now de-differentiate to become looser and looser and eventually cavitate to find the perilymphatic spaces. So let's see what that looks like. That looks like this. Here you've got, and again, this is a little bit later because you have not just one and a half turns, you have all the turns in through here, but now, this is late enough, you've got some neural elements going along the basal or membrane, and you have the otic epithelium sitting on the more uh, peripheral part of that. It's coming in towards what will be the medialis. But what does this look like? This looks almost like a little bit of a Mondini, doesn't it? Just a, this is all the reticulum, the thinner mesenchyme, which is now going to cavitate to find the perilymphatic spaces. And if it cavitated out completely like this, you'd end up with a normal basal or turn, but then with an apical and second turn just as a second cavity, somewhat like a Mondini. I'm not saying it's exact, but uh, you get the general idea. There's something missing still. What typically, normally, would separate these out? Well, all right, here is the otic epithelium, basal or membrane, and here you've got a little bit of the neural elements. Now you've got some cavitation, a nice beginning forming of the scala tympani, scala vestibuli, and now you have these little bits of bone. These are membranous bone that come off from the inner layer of the cochlea and spread out towards the medialis. Medialis forms the same way. That's the final thing in separation. So you have the otic epithelium, and then here you have the cavitation to find the perilymphatic spaces, and now you have the membranous bone, not membranous labyrinth, that's this, membranous bone coming up to do the final segmentation. So here's the Mondini, here's normal. Now if you look at this, here you've got the nerve going out uh, to the basal or membrane organ of Cordy, and that's really right out here. It looks almost the same. In fact, if you don't form uh, the interscalar bony septum, this space and this would look almost the same. So this is an under-segmentation anomaly. This is, again, you have all of the turns, but now you have poor separation, and that would end up looking like this. Now, here, again, once we said, you can pick up some of the membranous segmentation uh, here on the MRI, but that's why CT, some people think it looks a little, uh, is easier to understand or to read, but here, if you take these two spaces together, you're looking at this 
combined space. So scale of vestibuli of one turn, scale of timpani of the other. So again, this comes from the membranous, uh, sorry, the uh, mesoderm is going to be responsible for finding this type of segmentation. All right, now in the last couple minutes, we're going to talk about the anatomy one more time because uh, not only do we have uh, some, uh, uh, some of the anatomy is better seen in other projections or other planes. So the two that we tend to use are the post-shell because it's perpendicular to almost everything. The facial nerve is perpendicular to vestibular aqueducts, course, if you will. So it's the best way to measure. It goes right down the medialis of the cochlea. So some people like this as well. Here you can see the facial nerve coming right along. Just draw a line through Dr. Vigneault's diagram and you're all, all set. There's the facial nerve. So again, it's just a different plane. It's the exact perpendicular to the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. And it's also very good for looking at the oval window and the round window and the superior semicircular canal. Here's the facial nerve and perfect cross section oval window, round window, and here this patient has a dehiscence of the superior canal, not a complete hole, there's still dura and ostium, if you will, uh, so but you see that as a complete curve. Stenberg's plane, we use that when we're looking for the uh, superior canal, looking for a dehiscence because it's an exact cross-section of it, so we think this is the best way to measure it. All right, so now we're back, and we're, that's about all we have to talk about. It's an incredibly complex bone. But if you know uh, the diagram, if you've do used Dr. Vigneault's diagram, uh, and look at those index images, I think you can learn the anatomy pretty quickly. The embryology is fascinating to about three people in the world, but it is interesting, and it does have an, an effect on what we see. We talked about the cochlea, but also uh, maybe we can talk at another time about the position of the facial nerve and the middle ear. So here are some, and you can refer to these later, but here are some references. And again, I really treasure the time we get to spend together. And I hope we can do this next year without the virtual component, without the uh, connections like to see this happen in person. But again, temporal bone anatomy is key. And once you know a little bit about it, knowing the individual landmarks that have such an important thing to say about the abnormalities that we seek uh, really will take you a long way. So thank you so much for your time and attention. The next speaker is Luke Ledbetter, Associate Professor of Radiology Department of Radiological Science, the David Geffen School of Medicine, UCLA, Los Angeles, California. His topic is external auditory canal abnormalities. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining um, this part of the temporal bone session. My name is Luke Ledbetter. I'm a head and neck radiologist at UCLA in Los Angeles, California. And for the next 25 minutes, we are going to be talking about the external ear and auditory canal. An outline of how we're going to approach this topic. First, we want to talk about the anatomy with really focus on the function and physiology of this area. We are going to move on and touch on some embryology, uh, talk about the normal development of this area, because uh, the understanding of that will help lead us to see the malformations that we commonly can encounter in this area. We're going to move on and talk about um, inflammatory and infectious disease that affects the external ear and auditory canal. And then we're going to end up talking about some tumors and neoplastic processes that we can encounter here. But to start off, let's talk about the functional anatomy of the external ear and auditory canal. To start off, let's move as superficial as possible and talk about the oracle. So the oracle is a skin-covered cartilaginous structure um, that is very readily examined visually um, and clinically 
And so a lot of times abnormalities of this area are clinically diagnosed and, and doesn't move on to imaging. However, when it does, often they are um, accompanied with medical terms about the anatomy of the oracle. And so I think it's good for us just to go over just briefly some of these substructures of the oracle. So when we see these on report, um, we can understand what they're talking about. Or if we see an abnormality localized to one of these areas, um, we can accurately describe it. So first are these two kind of semicircular cartilaginous um, rings that are along the peripheral aspect of the oracle. The one that is most peripheral, the biggest, is called the helix. And the one on the internal surface, more, um, more towards the external auditory canal, is called the um, anti-helix. Now the helix goes all the way um, from anterior and swoops around um, to posterior, and the helix, anti-helix kind of um, mimics that curvature more internally. If we move a little bit farther inferior, we'll see two cartilaginous bumps, um, just superficial to and a little bit inferior to the external auditory canal, and this is known as the tragus um, anteriorly and antitragus um, posteriorly. These are um, two areas to help protect that external auditory canal. And then you have a soft tissue lobule that, that, that extends off the inferior margin of the oracle. If we look more internal, we have the concha, um, is kind of that smooth skin um, covered bowl almost of the oracle, which leads as kind of a funnel directly into the external meatus, into the external auditory canal. If we correlate with this with imaging, we take cross sections through several areas of the oracle going um, high uh, superiorly. We can see that helix again, it wraps from anterior to posterior, so it's the most peripheral cartilaginous um, um, surface that we can see. And then internal to that, that kind of follows and mimics that curvature is the anti helix. We go further inferior, just below the level of the external auditory canal. We can see that helix is the most peripheral part, the anti-helix more internal to that. Now we can see that concha, that smooth bowl that kind of funnels towards the external auditory canal. We can see the beginning of the tragus, that cartilaginous bump anteriorly, which um, allows for some protection um, to this area. One more slice, a little bit more inferior, we can see that tragus anteriorly, that anti-tragus um, um, on the opposite side of that. Again, where the helix is that more peripheral part, and then the concha as well is the smooth bowl um, that funnels into the external auditory canal. But what is the purpose of the oracle? Really, um, the main thing is to filter and direct sound waves towards the external auditory canal. Um, so any sound waves coming in from any direction will hit these cartilaginous um, outpouchings and then be redirected towards the internal auditory canal. Um, uh, there is some function of filtering out different frequencies uh, to select uh, the frequencies that we um, selectively hear as humans, as well as it amplifies the sound into the external auditory canal to allow us to hear better. Um, our ears are fairly um, superficial and small, and that's one of the main reasons we hear um, um, differently than animals, and they have a broader range of frequencies and intensities they can hear because their oracle components are bigger and can more um, strongly direct and, and amplify sounds from any which direction. Lastly, and probably most importantly these days, um, the oracle is is they got a very important function of holding up our face masks. Um, so please allow the oracle to do its job and wear a face mask. Moving on to the external auditory canal, um, two main portions of the external auditory canal um, superficially. Um, it's the first, it's the cartilaginous external auditory canal. You can see that it kind of forms an S-shaped curvature. It is not a direct straight um, canal leading into the middle ear, um, but superficially as the borders are all made of um, cartilage. And we can see that outlined there in orange. If we move a little bit um, higher, we can see now the osseous external auditory canal. Now this is still covered in skin, um, but now the borders is made up of the tympanic portion of that temporal bone. Um, and this is the more medial aspect, and this will extend all the way towards the tympanic membrane.
Now, this is also covered with a um, keratinized squamous epithelium, and that squamous epithelium is continuous all along the superficial um, surface of the tympanic membrane, um, which will become important when we talk about some of the inflammatory disorders that we um, will encounter later. Looking at coronal, we can see both the cartilaginous and the osseous external um, auditory canal, um, both covered by a, a um, keratinized squamous epithelium. The cartilaginous external auditory canal also has um, apricot sweat glands. Um, this is where the cerumen is produced um, out laterally um, that helps lubricate and protect the external auditory canal. Now, I've mentioned uh, the keratinized squamous epithelium several times. This is important um, when we talk about inflammatory dis disorders later. But the normal physiology to remember, the ear is a self-cleaning um, area. So there is a very orderly migration of uh, keratin debris and um, desquamated epithelium as it centrally within the tympanic membrane will move peripherally to the walls of the external auditory canal and then will all migrate in an order from um, medial to lateral or internal to external. So this is a very orderly process in the normal physiologic state. The ear is a self-cleaning um, area. One normal variant to talk about is the foramen tympanicum. This can be a small bony defect in the anterior inferior osseous or bony external auditory canal um, communicates there with the temporomandibular joint. Small, incidentally found, um, is just a normal variant. However, this can be a route of spread of infection, or if it can be large enough, may cause symptoms with mastication. Um, but most of the time, just small is a uh, normal variant. All right, let's move on to the embryology and development of this area. Um, this is a graphical uh, representation of the branchial um, apparatus that a lot of our face and head and neck structures are derived from. Now there, this is a bilateral structure, um, so I'm just showing one side. But in blue, those lobulated structures are the branchial arches. They're labeled one through four, um, one being obviously most superior, four being most inferior. On the external surface, those invaginations between the branchial arches are called branchial clefts. And on the internal um, surface, those invaginations are called branchial pouches. So which of these areas play into the external ear and auditory canal? Well, the first branchial cleft is where the EAC develops from. Along the superficial margins of the first and second branchial arches um, in development, they'll develop kind of six little bumps or outpouching articles called um, helix, and those will all migrate together and eventually form that oracle that we talked about. So first and second branchial um, arches form the oracle, the first branchial cleft forms the EAC. Now, important um, that goes along with um, these external ear and auditory canals is that first and second branchial arches also form um, your ossicles within your middle ear cavity, most of the ossicles. Um, so these two areas are very closely tied together. The first branchial pouch, that internal component between the first and second branchial arch, will form the tympanic cavity. So you can see this first and second branchial arch and the cleft and pouch associated with it is very closely related and forms the external ear, the EAC, the tympanic cavity, and the ossicles. Now these all form over a period of about 15 weeks, and so if anything goes wrong in this area um, in development, then we are going to see a large spectrum of abnormalities um, from that involve all these different areas. So they're very tightly, tightly closed, um, tied together. So um, a general term that we can say when this is abnormal is a congenital oral dysplasia. And so we will see a spectrum of abnormalities of the oracle, so microtia or anosia, um, spectrum of abnormalities of the external auditory canal uh, all the way from atresia, as you can see in this case, to um, small or stenotic EACs, and then abnormalities of the middle ear as well. Now this is not a middle ear talk, but these are very tightly close, um, tied together, um, so you need to know this is when you're evaluating the external ear. So the middle ear cavity can be abnormal, can be small, and the ossicles frequently are abnormal as well. So in this case, you can see the patient has microtia on that right side. That ear is kind of small, thicker than it is on the normal contralateral side. There is no 
external auditory canal at all, and that middle ear cavity is smaller than the other side, and the ossicles are fused and um, um, abnormal. And so when a patient has an abnormal external ear, this is very easily seen on examination, but they commonly image because they want to know what's going on with the medial EAC and middle ear cavity. Now the inner ear is formed by the uh, otic placode, which forms from neural ectoderm separate from these branchial arch systems. Um, while they're tied together, most of the time the inner ear is normal in these patients. The, about a third of patients could have inner ear abnormalities, but most of the time they're normal, and the middle ear is closely tied to the external ear. Here's another patient with microtia, small abnormal ear. This is the, the contralateral side put side by side for um, closer comparison. But you can see in this patient that the EAC is formed but small compared to the other side. And the tympanic membrane is also slight, or the tympanic cavity is also slightly small on this side. Um, here is a case of a newborn with anosia. So the, um, the oracle did not form at all bilaterally and the external auditory canals did not form. So a large spectrum of disease, um, but really closely evaluate the external and middle ear structures together. Now, outside of the globinal abnormalities that can happen in this area, you also have your first branchial cleft is where the EAC forms from. So you can have um, the first branchial cleft cyst that may persist um, into life is closely associated with the external auditory canal. Um, so they are commonly right around this general region. You can have a branchial cleft cyst is the most common um, presentation, lobulated T2 bright fluid filled structures. Um, you could have um, branchial cleft sinuses, um, communications with the external auditory canal. Um, they can get super infected and is in this post contrast MR where the, the fluid has peripheral enhancement. Um, the infection can spread to surrounding soft tissues like the parotid or into the, um, the mucosa of the EAC. So, um, fluid collections or cysts around the EAC, think of first branchial cleft cysts. Um, other congenital abnormalities that will happen in here that may mimic this lymphatic malformations, um, venous malformations. Um, typically you know, show enhancement or fluid fluid levels with lymphatic malformations, um, but simple cystic areas right around the EAC, think of first branchial cleft cysts. Now we're going to move on to infectious and inflammatory disorders of the uh, um, external ear. I'm going to come back to this slide where we talked about that migration, um, that self-cleaning apparatus of the external ear where um, keratin and um, exfoliated debris migrates in a very orderly fashion from um, centrally the tympanic membrane to peripherally to the external auditory canal and then from external or from internal to external. Now if there is um, some abnormality in this then we um, develop the clinical situation that we occasionally image. First, which I'm going to talk about is keratosis obturans. So this is a disorder, this migration, where that keratin um, debris um, basically becomes stuck. It becomes a keratin plug. So we'll see a soft tissue filling of the external auditory canal. It will uh, go all the way medial and abut the tympanic membrane. But this is an abnormality of debris centrally within that um, canal. And so what commonly what we can see is that debris will cause pressure and benignly enlarge the external auditory canal. We see no bony destruction in this. The abnormality is that keratin centrally within the canal, um, not into the walls. Um, so this is keratosis obturans, it's a keratin plug within the EAC. Let's contrast this with medial canal fibrosis. Now what this is, is actually fibrotic changes along the medial external auditory canal abutting the tympanic membrane. Um, so this is actually fibrotic changes of that um, superficial surface, not the keratin plug. Commonly what we see on this is also soft tissue that abuts the tympanic membrane, but very often it has this crescentic shape um, superficially. Um, it can help tell between the medial canal fibrosis and the keratosis obturans. We can also see this on this coronal image, that um, external kind of crescentic shape. Uh, the canal is not enlarged. Um, this often occurs after some sort of injury to the, um, the squamous epithelium of the external auditory canal, post-infectious from otitis um, externa, um, uh, 
from tumors, from radiation, from surgery, from trauma. There's something that has injured the epithelium, and this is a fibrotic response as opposed to keratosis obturans, which was a keratin plug stuck in the middle of the EAC. Another disorder along these lines is cholesteatoma. So now this is squamous epithelium that has gotten under that mucosal surface. Um, it is trapped. It is still exfoliating. That keratin debris causes a keratin mass and then a surrounding inflammatory change. So often you'll have bony destruction um, associated with the cholesteatoma. On examination, this is going to be a submucosal mass. If you look close enough on this case um, where you see this soft tissue um, abnormality along the inferior EAC, you see bony destructions, you may be able to tell there's little bony flecks centrally within it. And that is a good sign for cholesteatoma. That is not present in all cholesteatomas, but if you saw bony debris centrally within the lesion, that may lead you that direction. This patient also had an MR, so this T1 post-contrast um, fat-saturated MR. Um, this is a keratin lesion, right? So there's no vascularity. You should not see enhancement. You may see enhancement around the edge where that inflammatory changes, but the lesion itself will not enhance. And then the slam dunk is that keratin debris um, usually shows restricted diffusion. So um, all this together, this is diagnostic of a external auditory canal cholesteatoma. Just to review these one more time in graphical representation, keratosis obturans, it's that keratin plug within the external auditory canal, will benignly expand um, the EAC if it gets large enough and long enough with pressure will um, benignly expand it. Medial canal fibrosis is a fibrotic reaction to previous injury and they will commonly have that crescentic uh, external margin. And a cholesteatoma is a squamous epithelium that gets submucosal trapped either congenitally or through trauma. Um, and then that keratin, um, uh, exfoliated keratin will cause an inflammatory response and actually destroy bone. So um, hopefully that will be a good overview and you can um, separate all three of these entities when you see an abnormality, inflammatory abnormality of the external auditory canal. Um, there's also some bony abnormalities that happen in the external auditory canal that will look like submucosal um, lesions to someone looking um, through otoscopy. Um, on the left, you see exostoses. Um, this is from repeated exposure to cold water most of the time. It's also known as surfer's ear. And this will cause a circumferential bony kind of smooth outgrowth, which will narrow the external auditory canal. And you can see that that patient has some debris or cerumen um, kind of trapped um, just lateral to it. Um, also, there is on the right, this is an osteoma. This is a fibrooseous lesion um, that is pedunculated. Um, it is going to be eccentric, um, a benign lesion, but also can narrow the external auditory canal. Moving on to infection. Um, this uh, any infectious or inflammation of the external auditory canal that um, squamous epithelium is called otitis externa. Um, just simply, this, you're just going to see mucosal thickening. Often, will kind of taper as it goes along and could completely occlude the EAC. This is commonly um, associated with infection in surrounding um, structures, maybe inflammation in the middle ear. Mastoid is in this case. And as you can see on the post-contrast CT, this patient actually had an abscess superficial to their mastoid. But any kind of infection localized inflammation of the external auditory canal is otitis externa. Now, we talked about that foramen tympanicum earlier, as that is a route of spread of infection to get out of the external uh, auditory canal and the surrounding soft tissues. Also, in this diagram from an AJN article from Vandermeer, um, shows in the cartilaginous external auditory canal, there's small little gaps between the, cartil the cartilage, and that's referred to referred to as the fissures of Santorini. And these were also all areas where infection could potentially spread out from the external auditory canal. This comes to play in the, pro the condition known as necrotizing otitis externa. These patients are almost all diabetic. Um, they are slightly immunocompromised. They have diabetic uh, vasculopathy. And almost all, up to 98% of these patients, are all infected with pseudomonas. So this will cause an inflammatory, infectious thickening of the external auditory canal. 
but will also spread through these um, routes through the foramen tympanicum and fissures of Santorini and potentially get into the deep face and skull based soft tissue. So you can see in this patient there's a large area of an erosion in the occipital um, condyle near the jugular foramen. Um, on Pokes contrast MR you can see this ill-defined um, infectious inflammatory soft tissue thickening and enhancement with it extends into the skull base and this would be a case of necrotizing otitis externa. Lastly, we're just going to touch on some neoplastic processes. The important thing to remember with um, the tumors that happen here, they're almost all related to sun-exposed skin. So squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, melanoma, um, it's all processes that typically happen superficially and then secondarily invade medially. So most of the time these are known prior to imaging, they've been biopsied and now they just want to see the deep extent. Um, so this is a case of squamous cell carcinoma. The oracle is thick, mass-like, and then that, inf that tumor is in extending into the internal auditory canal, going from external to internal. These can destroy bone, of course, as any malignant process could, um, but typically it is a total bone destruction. You won't see that internal bony flakes that sometimes you see in cholesteatoma. Um, so again, all these neoplastic processes happen from superficial um, and extend internal. Another case of squamous cell carcinoma, a thickened irregular oracle, the, the tumor happens on that sun exposed skin and then it extends immediately. So our job is to see the internal extension, describe any um, bony um, destruction, nodal drainage is commonly to the parotid, so that's another area you really want to focus on in these cases. This is a case of basal cell carcinoma, just a locally aggressive tumor, usually won't show up with nodal metastasis, but similar thing. It will happen on the sun-exposed part of the oracle and then extend medial into the external auditory canal. All right, so that's a whirlwind tour through um, a lot of the anatomy and pathology that will happen in the external ear and auditory canal. Quick summary, remember the function of this area is to direct and amplify sound waves to the tympanic membrane. Developmentally, um, everything typically comes from the first brachial cleft and the first and second brachial arch. And so the other area that is tight, tightly associated with that is the middle ear and ossicles. So any um, abnormality of the external ear, you want to look in the middle ear and ossicles for associated abnormalities. Inflammatory processes are often associated with that abnormal epithelium or migration of the keratin. Remember, keratosis obturans is a keratin plug that can expand the external auditory canal. Medial canal fibrosis is a fibrotic reaction to previous injury and have a crescentic outer margin. And a cholesteatoma is trapped epithelium in a submucosal location, and that keratin debris will cause an inflammatory um, change and bone uh, destruction. Infection, uh, remember the big one, uh, the necrotizing otitis externa, diabetics with pseudomonas infection, and they uh, like to spread inferior medially into the face and skull base through the foramen tympanicum and fissures of Santorini. And lastly, tumor, almost always it is from sun-exposed skin and will inv in invade from external to internal, and our job is to uh, describe how far internal that has extended into. I appreciate you taking time and listening to my talk. Um, it is uh, a great to, to talk again at ASHNR. My email address and Twitter handle are there. I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. Feel free to reach me, um, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Hillary Kelly, Assistant Professor of Radiology, Harvard Medical School, Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, from Boston, Massachusetts. Her talk will be on middle ear lesions. Hi everyone, this is Hillary Kelly and this morning we're going to be discussing middle ear lesions. I have no disclosures relevant to this talk. So over the course of this talk we're going to review the clinical and imaging findings that you can use to narrow your differential diagnosis for middle ear lesions. Otoscopic findings alone can provide the clinician and radiologist with critical information to improve pre-biopsy diagnosis of middle ear lesions. If there's a retrotympanic lesion, you want to know does it have a distinctive hue or location, as the color can significantly narrow the possibilities. If you don't have a documented otoscopic exam, you can still provide your differential diagnosis based on the patient's age, the location within the middle ear, and the presence or absence of enhancement. So we're going to start with lesions that present as a red mass behind the tympanic membrane.
Our first lesion is the glomus tympanicum, which is the most common benign tumor in the middle ear. Classically on CT, you will see a mass with a flat base along the cochlear promontory, as we see here in this case of a 54-year-old female with a red middle ear mass on the left. Importantly, the floor of the middle ear cavity was intact, and there was no permeative destruction of the jugular plate. So by, this is a glomus tympanicum rather than a glomus jugular tympanicum or jugulare, which we'll discuss next. High resolution CT with bone detail is the most helpful imaging study for diagnosis and for relating tumor extent to surgical landmarks and for determining the surgical approach. Glomus tympanicum tumors tend to produce symptoms early such that when they're first seen, they are often well-defined intratympanic soft tissue lesions without bone involvement. They may extend into the external auditory canal, and often, even when filling the tympanic cavity, they leave the ossicles intact. On MRI, we see an avidly enhancing mass with a flat base along the cochlear promontory, corresponding to that soft tissue density lesion we saw on the prior CT. Now, glomus jugular tympanicum lesions will demonstrate permeative destructive bone changes along the jugular foramen margin. The middle ear component can appear identical to the glomus tympanicum with that round lesion with a flat base along the cochlear promontory. However, you will have extension through the floor of the middle ear cavity to involve the jugular. On MRI, you can see that characteristic paraganglioma appearance with salt and pepper, the salt referring to the hyperintense foci within the tumor related to slow flow or hemorrhage, and pepper referring to those high velocity arterial flow voids. However, in this case, the lesion was small and we just saw homogeneous enhancement. Although MRI imaging does not show bone changes or tumor relationships to bony landmarks as well as high resolution CT, it does define the infralabyrinthine soft tissue extension much better than CT, and thus the two procedures are of complementary value for evaluation of these lesions. Elaborate classification systems have been devised matching tumor extent to surgical procedures. For most radiologists, the detail of the classification systems are not relevant, but the principles behind them are of practical importance, even if you're only consulted on such cases occasionally. As you can see, the surgical approach varies significantly with the anatomic extent, and larger tumors may require middle cranial fossa approaches and should be done at a skull base center, and you may even need to involve a neurosurgeon if there's a transdural component. Preoperative embolization is also a consideration for glomus jugulare or jugular tympanicum tumors, whereas tympanicum tumors, the surgical blood loss is small and just ice as the surgery can be transcanal or through the mastoid. In the glomus jugulare tumors, the blood loss can be significant, one or one and a half liters or greater, and preoperative embolization is often used. Here's another example of a 20-year-old female with facial paresis and a history of adrenalectomy. So a glomus facial is an extremely rare lesion, and the, uh, the examples in the literature typically involve the mastoid segment. As with paragangliomas elsewhere, we'll see a permeative destructive lesion, but we'll see it along the facial nerve canal, and the history is also a clue. So here in this case, we have this lobulated lesion that involved the mastoid segment and tympanic segments of the facial nerve canal which on MRI demonstrated avid homogeneous enhancement. As we move into the mastoid in this example, you can see the more permeative destructive appearance along the mastoid, and we have more of that um, heterogeneous appearance with hypo-intense flow voids on MRI. So in this patient who had a history of multiple paragangliomas, this was a paraganglioma along the facial nerve. Again, these are extremely rare lesions. This next entity doesn't often present as a middle ear mass, but typically we'll see venous malformations in the middle in, uh, in the temporal bone along the facial nerve of the geniculate. However, in this case, we had a lesion that looked just like a glomus tympanicum. We had this round lesion with a flat base along the cochlear promontory. There was some destruction of the floor of the um, middle ear cavity with extension into the jugular, and this was thought to be a glomus jugulo tympanicum. However, when this was removed by immunohistochemistry, it was found to be a benign venous malformation rather than a paraganglioma. But this is an unusual location for this entity, and it mimicked a glomus tumor. On MRI, you can see it was avidly enhancing, and again, it involved the middle ear cavity with extension toward, through the floor of the middle ear cavity towards the jugular foramen. Now, the aberrant carotid artery will appear as a tubular lesion crossing the middle ear cavity from posterior to anterior. An enlarged inferior tympanic canuliculus is an important observation. 
30% of aberrant internal carotid arteries will have a persistent stapedial artery, although that was not seen in this case. These are typically asymptomatic and discovered at the time of routine physical exam, during middle ear surgery, or as an incidental imaging finding. Patients can present with pulsatile tinnitus and conductive hearing loss, but either way, it's extremely important to identify this as the ICA and not a mass to avoid catastrophic surgical consequences. Now, rather than clearly red, we can also have pink lesions behind the tympanic membrane. This first entity is a meningioma involving the middle ear. This is a 36-year-old female with mild left facial weakness and hearing loss. There was a lesion centered at the geniculate and anterior tympanic segments of the facial nerve canal with this somewhat osseous matrix and expansile nature. This could have been a benign venous malformation. However, the clue in this case was hyperostosis along the floor of the middle ear, um, so, oh, sorry, along the floor of the middle cranial fossa, as well as some dural enhancement along the floor of the middle cranial fossa here and here. And at surgery, this was proved to be a meningioma. Here's another example which mimicked a middle ear max. This was thought to most likely be a schwannoma, which we'll talk about in a minute, but also turned out to be a meningioma. In this case, there are really no distinguishing features on CT. The bony changes are hazy and maybe a bit infiltrative in the adjacent mastoid air cells. But there was no hyperostosis or any other clues to this diagnosis by CT. However, on MRI, the answer is obvious. We were really only seeing the tip of the iceberg in the middle ear. And as we can see on these post-contrast T1-weighted images, there is a large lesion in the IAC, CP angle, and jugular foramen with avid enhancement in dural tails. This is clearly a meningioma, but it presented with hearing loss and a middle ear mass on exam. Now, there are many synonyms for this next entity, adenomatous tumor of the middle ear, middle ear carcinoid, neuroendocrine adenoma, adenoid tumor, and there are numerous acronyms. Regardless of the name, these lesions can have a very nonspecific imaging appearance. In this example, we have a 43-year-old female with left hearing loss, and we see opacification of the middle ear with partial encasement of the ossicles. When these lesions encase the ossicles, there is no, there is no ossicular destruction 80% of the time, and bone invasion is not characteristic. Therefore, a CT of this lesion can give an appearance that cannot be distinguished from that of chronic otitis media. Although the well-pneumatized and well-aerated mastoid air cells may be a clue that can argue against a chronic inflammatory process. On MR imaging, it is typically low to intermediate signal on T1-weighted imaging and high signal on T2 with avid enhancement. These lesions can enhance similar to a glomus tympanicum, and the enhancement excludes a middle ear cholesteatoma or a chronic inflammation. If a large adenoma is present, the contrast enhanced MR may be helpful in defining the lesion extent from the adjacent obstructed secretions. So in the MRI in this 43 year old female with left sided hearing loss, we just see this avid enhancement corresponding to the soft tissue opacification we saw on the prior CT. Here's another example of a 49 year old female with conductive hearing loss on the right. On temporal bone CT, we see a middle ear mass it's behind an intact tympanic membrane according to the history. There was no bony destruction and the ossicles were intact. This is indistinguishable on bone CT from a glomus tympanicum. In this case, there was no history of chronic otitis media and there was a well-pneumatized mastoid. So we were not thinking that this was chronic inflammation. On T1 pre-contrast, they can be intermediate or even slightly hyperintense, as in this case, which may be a clue. On T2, they're typically hyperintense, but have been reported to be hypointense in some cases as well. These lesions will have avid uptake on ectriotide scintigraphy, but that does not distinguish them from paragangliomas. Ultimately, the imaging features are nonspecific. As I keep mentioning, the clinical exam and otoscopy are important to narrow your differential diagnosis, and in this case, the absence of facial nerve symptoms and a pink mass on otoscopy may be helpful to distinguish them from a globus tympanicum or facial nerve schwannoma. Now, moving on to the white mass behind the tympanic membrane, these are the lesions that it's important to know if the tympanic membrane is intact or not. If it's intact as here, or if there's rupture or retraction proxy as here. So when we have a white mass behind an intact tympanic membrane, we can think of a congenital cholesteatoma, typically seen in pediatric patients. This six-year-old male presented with a white mass behind an intact tympanic membrane. And we can see this lobulated soft tissue partially filling the middle ear cavity on the cochlear promontory and overlying the oval window, medial to the malleus and incus. 
Here's another example in a four-year-old female with cholesteatoma in the middle ear behind an intact tympanic membrane. She had no history of surgery, otitis media, or otorrhea. On CT, we typically see a well-circumscribed soft tissue middle ear mass medial to the ossicles. The long process of the incus and the stapes are the most commonly destroyed ossicles, and if the adipose ad antrum is included, occluded, mastoid aerosol opacification due to retained secretions can be seen. However, in most cases, you'll see normal mastoid pneumatization. Here's another example in a 16-month-old male with conductive hearing loss and an intact tympanic membrane. We see rounded soft tissue medial to the ossicles. Unfortunately, I don't have an MRI example for congenital cholesteatoma, but the MRI signal characteristics are the same for congenital or acquired, so we'll talk about MRI in a minute. For acquired cholesteatoma, the tympanic membrane is not intact, and typically the exam will describe a retraction pocket or perforation and a white mass on otoscopy. Here's a 50-year-old female who presented with left ear fullness, and we can see opacification of the epitympanum and mastoid with erosion of the sputum, ossicles, facial nerve canal, and tegmen. The lateral canal was intact in this case. In addition to describing the typical erosion of the sputum and ossicles that we typically see with pars flaccid cholesteatoma, on CT it is important to look for lateral semicircular canal, facial nerve canal, and tegmen, tympani, or mastoidium dehiscence. I'm not showing an example here today, but pars tensa acquired cholesteatoma is usually presented as an erosive mass in the posterior mesotympanum also found medial to the ossicles like congenital cholesteatoma, but in those cases, the tympanic membrane will not be intact. On MRI, we see a rim-enhancing lesion in the middle ear corresponding to that soft tissue density we saw on CT. With cholesteatoma, we often like to use these non-echoplanar DWI sequences. The coronal plane and non-EPI technique minimize susceptibility artifact and increase sensitivity for detection of very small lesions, as small as 2 millimeters. And this is highly specific due to the high keratin content of cholesteatoma. So in this 50-year-old female who presented with fullness on the left, we see the classic MR imaging findings confirmed by restricted diffusion. As I mentioned on CT, it is important to look for lateral semicircular canal, facial nerve canal, and tegmen tympani or mastoidium dehiscence. If the tegmen is dehiscent, you can do an MRI with these inversion recovery sequences to exclude an encephalocele, which we will talk about more in a bit. In this case, no encephalocele was present. We can see a nice intact cortical ribbon, and the gray matter is intact without, and not disrupted or herniated through that tegmen defect that we saw on CT. Moving on to facial schwannoma, in addition to a white mass behind the tympanic membrane, these patients typically present with symptoms of hearing loss and cranial nerve 7 paresis. On temporal bone CT, we'll see a tubular mass spanning multiple intratemporal cranial nerve 7 segments. In this case of a 61-year-old male who came with a history of, quote, abnormal mastoid on MRI, we just saw a complete opacification of the middle ear and mastoid, so it was somewhat nonspecific. But you can see that there was widening and dehiscence of the tympanic segment of the facial nerve canal, which in retrospect was a clue in this case. The CT appearance of facial nerve schwannomas depends on which segments are involved. At the geniculate fossa, you can see smooth ovoid enlargement of the canal, which is what sort of the classic appearance of facial nerve schwannoma is that most of us know. When it involves the tympanic segment, however, you can get a pedunculated lesion that protrudes into the middle ear cavity, presenting as a middle ear mass. At the mastoid segment, you can either have a tubular lesion with sharp margins or a globular lesion with irregular margins as it breaks into the mastoid air cells. On MRI, we can see homogeneous enhancement that's contiguous with the enlarged facial nerve canal. You can also see in this case that there was extension into the labyrinth. So this was a very extensive schwannoma. Here's another example in a 49-year-old male with a parotid mass. On comb beam CT, he has this massive enlargement of the tympanic segment of the facial nerve canal. And you can see on the axial plane that we have extension into that mastoid, which resulted in that more irregular appearance of the bony margins due to rupture into the mastoid air cells. MRI more clearly delineates the enhancing tumor from obstructed mastoid air cells. And on the coronal, you can see this homogeneously enhancing lesion extending inferiorly through the stylomastoid foramen and the massive enlargement of the mastoid segment. On MRI, these lesions are similar to schwannomas elsewhere with intermediate to low signal on T1 pre-contrast, hyperintense signal on T2, and avid enhancement on post-contrast imaging. In this patient on TT, you can see that it was very hyperintense, extending through the stylomastoid foramen into the parotid gland. Moving on to the blue mass behind the tympanic membrane, our first entity is a normal venous variant when you have superior and lateral extension of the jugular bulb into the middle ear with a dehiscent bone. 
This is usually obvious. It's not bony erosion, but rather dehiscence, and it does not grow over time. On exam, there's a soft tissue mass in the middle ear, and they typically see it uh, posteriorly and inferiorly. With Valsalva or ipsilateral IJ compression, there may be increased size or distension on otologic exam. The otoscopic findings and bone CT findings make the correct diagnosis, and it's important to identify if the patient's going to have middle ear surgery for any other lesion to avoid injury to the jugular bulb. Patients can pre present with conductive hearing loss due to occlusion of the round window um, or obstruction of the uh, uh, ossicles and tympanic membrane vibration. You may also notice in this case, the patient had dehiscence of the superior semicircular canal. Here's another example, a six-year-old male who presented with left conductive hearing loss and a rubrous left middle ear mass on otoscopy. Rubrous apparently means red. To me, this looks a little more blue than red, but I'm not the ENT. On CT, there was lobulated soft tissue along the cochlear promontory with dehiscence of the bone along the floor of the EAC and jugular plate. So based on otoscopy, we suggested an MRI to exclude a glomus jugulo tympanicum, although at CT we didn't really see that permeative bony destructive appearance, but rather just dehiscence. So a dehiscent jugular bulb and diverticulum was suggested as a possible differential diagnosis. On MRI, we saw a hypo-intense flow void with a small diverticulum protruding into the floor of the middle ear. There was no enhancement whatsoever, so this is consistent with a dehiscent jugular bulb diverticulum mimicking a glomus jugular tympanicum. The plan originally had been to go to the operating room to remove this lesion, but after the MRI, they elected for observation. Now I'm going to discuss a few additional lesions in the middle ear, which are more rare. And first we'll start with a couple of rare pediatric destructive temporal bone lesions that can extend into the middle ear. Rhabdomyosarcoma is the most common soft tissue sarcoma in children, and up to 40% in children occurs in the head and neck with only 7% occurring in the temporal bone. Typically, these present in children less than six years old, and the history is often chronic otitis media, although they can also have otorita ear pain and external auditory canal polyp. Typically, we see these along the petrous apex or in the middle ear or mastoid. It'll be a destructive mass with variable contrast enhancement. Both CT and MRI are recommended to stage skull-based destruction and middle ear and intracranial extension. So here we see opacification and bony destruction along the middle ear and mastoid. There was corresponding avid enhancement on MRI with extension along the eustachian tube. Usually the lesion is iso-intense on T2. It can have, um, and the coronal images are best to detect intracranial extension via the tegmen. The other destructive pediatric temporal bone lesion that can involve the middle ear that we'll discuss is longer Hansel histiocytosis. This is typically seen in a male child or adolescent with otalgia and otorrhea. It's classically seen as a well-defined lytic lesion on CT with associated enhancing soft tissue mass on MRI. Now, LCAC is more often seen in the squamous and mastoid rather than the petrous apex or middle ear, but it can involve the middle ear and may present as a middle ear mass. As with rhabdomyosarcoma, both CT and MRI are often performed in complex cases, as bone CT is best for evaluating the osseous structures, and MRI is best for delineating the soft tissue extent. On T1 pre-contrast, you can see a marrow replacing process in the temporal bone, and you may see intrinsic T1 signal related to lipid-laden macrophages or blood products within the soft tissue mass. On T2, it's typically iso to hyperintense, but you can see fluid fluid levels, although not in this case. Moving on to a couple of miscellaneous lesions in adults, here we have a 53-year-old female with conductive hearing loss on the left. And on CT, we see a pedunculated osseous lesion in the middle ear cavity medial to the ossicles. And this was an osseoma. This is an unusual location for this entity, but can present as a white mass behind the tympanic membrane. I don't have an MRI in this case, but as with osteomas elsewhere, these will be non-enhancing and follow bone signal. The other non-enhancing lesion I'd like to point out briefly is an encephalocele, which can present as a middle ear mass Here's an 88-year-old female who had clear left otorrhea and history of tegmen repair on the opposite side 15 years ago for CSF leak and meningitis. On CT, we see a defect in the tegmen 
with soft tissue filling the adjacent epi tympanum. You may also notice superior semicircular canal dehiscence. On CT, we don't know if this is fluid, soft tissue, or even cholesteatoma. But on the coronal, C- uh, coronal T2 weighted image on MRI, we see a small amount of the temporal lobe herniating through the bony defect with disruption of the normal parenchymal architecture. And this is consistent with an encephalocele. The inversion recovery sequences are also nice to show that focal distortion of the cortical ribbon and a small amount of parenchyma herniating into the epitympanum. Lastly, there are a few lesions that can rarely present as a middle ear mass that I'm not showing examples of today for the sake of time, but wanted to mention. Typically, we see these in other clinical contexts and patients present with different symptoms, but endolymphatic sac tumors can extend into the middle ear and perineural tumor spread involving the facial nerve can expand into the middle ear cavity. Lastly, if you want to see a few interesting but rare lesions involving the middle ear, check out this electronic exhibit from some of my fantastic colleagues at Mass Eye and Ear. Okay, so let's summarize our differential diagnosis of middle ear lesions. Glomus tympanicum tumors are the most common benign tumors in the middle ear and will present as a red pulsatile mass in the middle ear along the cochlear promontory with an intact bony floor of the middle ear and jugular plate. Glomus jugulotympanicum or glomus jugulari lesions will have a similar appearance on imaging, but with erosion of the floor of the middle ear. In these cases, MRI is best for delineating the degree of infralabyrinthine soft tissue extension. Glomus tumors of the facial nerve are very rare, but of the few reported in the literature, most involve the mastoid segment, and facial nerve symptoms can be a helpful clue. Venous malformations are typically at the geniculate and present with facial nerve symptoms rather than as a middle ear mass, but can very rarely mimic a glomus tumor in the middle ear. The aberrant carotid artery has a characteristic appearance on CT with tubular extension through the middle ear cavity and an enlarged inferior tympanic canaliculus. If you have a pink mass behind the tympanic membrane, a meningioma is a possibility, typically along the geniculate, and hyperostosis and dural tails may be your clue to distinguish this from a schwannoma or benign venous malformation at the geniculate. Middle ear adenomas don't have any distinguishing imaging features and can mimic otitis media on CT, but we typically don't see bony erosion and they can be indistinguishable from facial nerve schwannoma or glomus tympanicum at CT and MRI together. Otoscopy and the lack of facial nerve symptoms can be helpful. With a white mass behind the tympanic membrane, it's important to know if the TM is intact or if it's ruptured and if there's a retraction pocket. Congenital cholesteatoma will present as white mass behind an intact TM, typically in pediatric patients. On CT, they'll be medial to the ossicles and non-enhancing on MRI. Acquired cholesteatoma will have a tympanic membrane defect, and pars tensile lesions can be in the same location as congenital cholesteatoma. Pars flaccid lesions will have that classic pressic space location, and as with all cholesteatomas, will be not enhancing or rim enhancing on MRI and will show restricted diffusion on the non-EPI coronal DWI. Facial nerve schwannomas will often present with facial nerve symptoms in addition to hearing loss, typically involve multiple facial nerve segments and enlargement or dehiscence of the canal can be the clue. These will enhance and MRI is helpful to distinguish enhancing tumor from obstructed secretions in the middle ear and mastoid. And lastly, with the dehiscent jugular bulb, otoscopy and CT are typically diagnostic. Valsalva or ipsilateral IJ compression can show distension of the lesion on otologic exam. And it's important to note this finding incidentally to avoid injury to the jugular bulb during mastoid surgery, mastoid or middle ear surgery. Here are these miscellaneous lesions we discussed. So if you have enhancing lesions in a pediatric patient, which can present as recurrent otitis media, don't um, these can be destructive lesions like rhabdomyosarcoma or longer Hansel histiocytosis. The miscellaneous lesions that are not enhancing an adult and will be white on otoscopy include osteoma, in which CT is key, or an encephalocele, where those inversion recovery sequences on MRI can make the diagnosis. Lastly, don't forget to check out those ASHNR electronic exhibits. And I thank you very much for your time.